About two years ago, we started this project, which is called uh, Appalachia. Initially, we had a goal of developing, you know, uh, a model checker for TLA that applies different abstractions and it allows you to verify parameterized systems. And it was a very nice workflow in the project proposal. But then we, we learned that TLA is a bit much harder than we thought initially. Right? I will not tell you what TLA is. Um, I just want to, you know, from our perspective, to tell you what makes it hard to implement uh, a symbolic model checker for TLA, actually. So first of all, uh, you know, when you develop a model checker, you usually have a very simple language. You have integers, loops, uh, maybe functions, uh, arrays, whatever. And TLA has all kind, kinds of complicated uh, language features. You can write sets of sets, power sets, functions, functions from sets to power sets, uh, and so on, you can imagine, right? There are tuples, sequences, and uh, people who are developing these automated tools, they usually try to, to have a small language and they develop tools for small languages, right? And TLA is the opposite of a small language. It's very concise, but it's, it's very full-featured at the same time, right? And of course, there are other things that are kind of by intention in TLA. There is no type system because it's not a programming language, right? There are no imperative statements, although there are some imperative kind of statements. And there is no any kind of a control flow. So coming from, you know, uh, a community that uh, usually writes tools for imperative languages, it's just a completely different mindset here, right? So in this talk, I told you that it's a parameterized model checker and abstraction involved. But uh, what we started with is we don't have any abstractions and we don't have any parameters, right? It's really like TLC. So the first goal we have is to develop a model checker that uses symbolic techniques, but everything's fixed, everything's finite. So we kind of want to compete with TLC on, on, on its own ground, right? So what we have here, these are the basic assumptions. Uh, the parameters are fixed and they're finite in the sense that you have finite sets, finite functions, uh, finite domains, finite codomains, everything's finite. Uh, we also realized that CLC has very reasonable restrictions on the formal structure, right? Uh, uh, spe specific ways how CLC actually evaluates the formula by, by going from left to right and finding some kind of assignments and so on and so forth. So we want to take all, all these restrictions and, and develop our own tool that uses symbolic techniques. And what's important here is that when you write a model checker, you usually want to to introduce some language restrictions. You say, yeah, this is not an important feature. I kick this uh, out from the language, but what we want to do, we want to have as few restrictions as possible, like TLC does. It's really a cool thing about TLC that it doesn't restrict the language unless it's really needed, right? And technically, I don't have to understand that, right? But technically, uh, since everything is finite, it also means that we expand all the quantifiers, we replace them with conjunctions and disjunctions. So in the end of the day, we get uh, quantifier-free formulas in SMT. There might be some integers, uh, uninterpreted functions, but actually it's a formula, a huge formula in a decidable fragment. So I just wanted to give you an impression of what we can cope with now. Uh, I'll give you an example of an algorithm that comes from the book by Nancy Lynch, right? And I'll show you that we can at least verify this example, right? So that's a classical uh, distributed algorithm. That's a classical distributed problem. You have a graph, for instance, you have a ring of four processes. Uh, what you have, you have n processes uh, placed in, in the nodes of this graph and processes uh, interact in synchronous rounds. So they send messages to each other and check the messages that arrived, right? So the algorithm that solves this maximal independent set problem, it has to find the nodes in the graph such that uh, if two nodes are in the independent set, they are not connected by an edge. And actually it has to find a maximal such an independent set, right? So for instance, here you have these two nodes, red nodes, they are in the maximal independent set. If you add two, then there will be two neighbors uh, that belong to the set, which is not uh, independent anymore. 
So there is actually an implementation, uh, there is an algorithm that solves this problem. It's randomized. I will not talk about randomization in my talk, right? We don't know how to deal with randomization. Uh, we'll just replace a randomization with non-determinism. And what happens here, this uh, algorithm, it does the following. There are three rounds. Every, every process goes uh, through the rounds one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. At every, so to, how to say, at, at, at every round that is labeled as round one, which repeats every three rounds, right? Every process randomly picks a value from, from this range from one to n to the four, which, where n is the number of processes, and then the exchange information, right? So in round one, if I find that my value is larger than the values of all of my numbers, I declare myself a winner and send, uh, send this message to the neighbors. If I, as a, as a process that didn't declare myself as a winner, if I receive a message winner from one of the neighbors, I declare myself a loser and, uh, and send everybody that I'm a loser, right? Send it to all the neighbors. And then, um, so if I receive a message from a loser, I, I forget about it, right? So I, I delete it from, from my set of the neighbors. And then once I'm a winner or a loser, I just uh, fall asleep and, and the other active processes keep trying to figure out who's winning and losing, right? Of course, uh, you can formalize it in CLA very nicely. I will not, I will. You don't have to read this one. You don't have to read this TLA code. It's just to give an impression. It's like one page and a half mm -hmm. of TLA code. It's not really a huge algorithm, but it's a real one, right? It's really an algorithm from the book. And again, just to give an impression of what kind of constructs you see in this algorithm, I will give you the things here. So you have a bit of features that we have to introduce just because our model checker is not so much advanced as TLC, right? So we directly, instead of constants, we directly declare uh, the number of processes as definition. Then n to the four is also a constant, uh, just you will see why. Uh, then we define the neighborhood as a function from a node number to, to the neighbors, right? In this case, I just define it as a, as a ring, right? So I just say, my neighbors are my, my, pre, uh, my predecessor and my successor, right? You can imagine that you can define other kinds of graph here. Then you have the round number, the value, which is randomly chosen. Then this awake status that is telling me whether I'm asleep or not. Then the set of neighbors uh, that is getting smaller uh, along the execution. The status saying whether I'm a loser or a winner. And the set of messages in the current round. So initially I have round one, then I pick a uh, value from this uh, interval from one to n to the four. Um, so initially everybody is awake, uh, uh, everybody knows about its neighbors, their neighbors, and initially the status is unknown and there are no messages in the message system, right? Then in the first round, what happens here? Uh, so you non-deterministically non pick a value from one to n to the four again. Um, in, in the original book code, you can see random here. Of course, we don't have it here, right? Uh, then you compute uh, all possible senders that you have, which means you take all your neighbors that I awake and you haven't deleted them from, from your set. Uh, compute the values based on the set of senders and then you find out whether you're a winner just by writing this quantified expression. So the reason why I'm explaining you all of this, I just want to show you what kind of expressions we can handle, right? It's not just integers, right? Or just sets of integers. And then you compute the status, right? If I'm awake and I'm a winner, then I declare myself winner or I just uh, keep my status unchanged. And you see here, we just compute functions, right? In, in this round, it's kind of the way we com uh, encode a synchronous eh, 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 white space synchronous computation, right? Uh, just by really computing the function for every, every node, right? And here we send messages. Uh, this is a, actually an interesting thing because what happens here, you compute a set of messages you send and then you use it right away in the condition that is telling you which messages uh, you evaluate, right? So we use the primed version of messages just to, to uh, keep things in one round instead of two. 
you could have introduced two rounds instead of one just to, to send all the messages and uh, evaluate them in the next step, right? But here we just merge these two, two steps into one. Then there is round two uh, where you, again, you, uh, you see if you have received a message from a winner and then you change your status uh, to winner if, if it's the case, uh, to loser if it's the case, and then you send, uh, right, uh, so, so you compute the, the, the winners that uh, have sent a message to a process then you figure out that uh, a process is a loser if it has received a winner and so on and so forth, right? So that's round one, round two. And round three is a bit simpler, right? Uh, so what you, what you see here, you again uh, compute the set of messages that were sent by the losers. And then you compute your wake status, so you, you go to sleep if uh, if you, were, you are a winner or a loser, and that's actually a small feature of our model checker, right? There are some problems on the way, right? You could have written it shorter, but there are type problems. And then you remove the neighbors uh, that uh, have sent you a message that uh, they are losers, right? So you j just remove the losers from the set. And as you see, there are pretty, pretty complex operations here. So you have sets, you have uh, functions, you have uh, set comprehensions, right? So it's not so easy to, to, to deal with the things actually. Right, and then putting it all together, what you have here, you compute the next round as uh, round plus one model three. And then you say, I either have round one, two or three, and of course it's decided in the particular action what round is actually we are in. And then you want to check this invariant, right? So for every pair of nodes, if, uh, if we are the neighbors, uh, either one of us is not a winner, right? So if, if we are both winners, it violates the independent set property, right? So I have encoded it in TLA, right? And uh, ran it for three processes, right? For the ring of size three. And then one day later, I, I think you have been through that, many of us have been through that, right? One day later, it's still running, right? Then you have to think a bit and uh, then you look, ah, there was this, actually this interval from one to n to the four, which means that for three processes, you actually have this interval of size 81, right? And then you use this expression a lot, essentially in every third round, you, you arbitrarily pick a value from this interval. So TLC is really crunching, crunching these numbers here, which is not the purpose, right? Then let's be a bit more fair to TLC, right? And set n to the fourth actually to n. So the smaller values of n to the fourth doesn't make sense, do not make sense because they really just prevent the algorithm from progressing. You really need at least unique values to make some progress. And then TLC does it in a minute, right? So really has diameter of seven, so it's not a very deep computation, just 3,000 uh, states, so it's all good, right? Uh, then you send, uh, set n and n to the four to five, right? Uh, it takes 10 minutes, so it's okay-ish, right? You can wait for 10 minutes. And then, yeah, you imagine that if I set it to six, it's, it's getting uh, slower and slower, right? Uh, so now we, we put it in our model checker, right? And it takes three minutes for n equal to five and n to the four, which is actually n to the four, right? Uh, which is uh, 625, right? Um, so it takes about three minutes. I will not, so there are some passes and I'll just explain you uh, the general things, right? So you, you say this, uh, that the, you have to check this invariant and if it works, I can even, Try to run it for n equal to three because it's a bit faster. Mm. So let's check. Um, okay, so here we have n equal to three and n to the four equals 81. That's the case where TLC takes a day, right? Or even more. Then we say, okay, let's try to, to check this invariant for the computations of length of 10. And this is invariant, right? And 
this moment I can pray, right? But it works. So what it does, it actually pushes uh, constraints that tell you what should happen if you have computations of lengths one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and until eight, right? And it prunes uh, some infeasible executions on the way if it finds that some some transition is not actually feasible, like I'm in round one, but I execute a transition for round two, then just prunes it away immediately from, from the set of constraints, right? So here we haven't found any error. And if I actually change the code, if I just fix this line and say, I don't care about the winning condition, it should find a counterexample, right? And okay, here it finds a counterexample. So we are, we are not integrated, you know, with this TLA toolbox yet. Uh, so we just uh, print things as they are, right? Uh, here just see some text output, right? Here's a state zero, here's a state one, and essentially just get all the values of, of, of the variables you have and constants that you have in your code, right? And this is a nice part because we, we are integrated with an SMT solver and it essentially gives us all these values. We just translate them back from, from the SMT language to, to TLA, right? So it works and we will not run it for different values of n, but I can give you this plot. So what I did here, uh, I changed the values of n from three to seven. So these are not arbitrary graphs, just rings of, of size up to seven. Uh, this is a logarithmic scale. So it looks like a line function, but it's actually, it's going like this, right? It's just for the purpose of this talk, I, I used the logarithmic scale. And as you see, of course, it's growing. The combinatorial uh, explosion is still there. So it's not disappearing, right? But it's kind of growing a bit slower than, than in case of TLC here. So we also did experiments with other benchmarks. Of course, our model checker does not work on many of the examples. It just will tell you, ah, I cannot handle this kind of expression. Or it doesn't support modules for the moment, right? But we did a bit of experiments. So we also considered this uh, termination detection algorithm uh, by Dijkstra, which was encoded by Stefan actually, right? And what we did here, we ran uh, our tool. Uh, you see this red plot in, in the green plot, and then we ran TLC as well, right? So the thing is that uh, for bounded model checking, we have to give the length of a computation. It's not uh, computing whether it has terminated or not, it just evaluates the length up to given size, uh, executions up to given length. Uh, what we did here, the green one, uh, the red one is showing you uh, the computations of lengths of the diameter. Here we actually know the diameter, it's three, to, three times n, and TLC actually confirms that. So if you go like this, you see the red one uh, is growing a bit, a bit, uh, so we need a bit more time on small, on small benchmarks. TLC goes like this, right? It, it works well, nice for the small benchmarks. But then at some point TLC just goes uh, to the ceiling and we still keep, uh, keep doing things, right? So we can evaluate large examples, right? And if you don't know the diameter, which is usually the case, uh, here we just pick the diameter of 40 and you see it requires uh, more time just to, to analyze executions, uh, the longer executions here. So it's much slower than TLC here, but again at some point uh, it starts to work a bit faster. Right? Of course, there are a lot of benchmarks where TLC works much better, actually. So, for instance, uh, this one, what you see here, that's Paxos. Uh, so, our model checker did not work uh, with the original code of Paxos. It required some tweaking because there are records in, in the code, and um, it's a bit hard to infer types for this. Um, yeah, we need the proper type inference there, actually. So what TLC does, it works very fast here for three ballots, right? It's like the minimal uh, interesting example. And our model checker is kind of slow, but if we increase the number of ballots, uh, say to 100, which would be impossible for TLC to cope with, uh, it still works, right? So it's kind of slow, but you know, uh, when we get larger sets, it's, it's uh, showing, uh, it's still working and showing interesting results. So if you want to run it, you can. I just have to warn you, it will probably crash on 
kind of uh, code that you probably have in, in the wild, right? If you have some industrial code, uh, I don't think it will work. But you can try it and, and try it with small examples. If you find some bugs, uh, that would be really helpful for us to, to see the tests uh, that are interesting for you. Um, and now I'll just uh, give you a brief idea of how it works, right? So it's like more theoretical side, but I will try to keep it uh, high level, right? So there are three essential steps we go through. And we understood that for a symbolic model checker, we, you actually need these three steps. First of all, we find, like TLC, we find assignments in the code because TLC, it actually interprets some of the of the expressions as assignments, right? It's kind of, TLA is not an imperative language, but TLC thinks it is, right? So it finds uh, assignments. We also do the same. We extract symbolic transitions. I will come back to that. Then we do some very stupid type inference. It's very simple. Uh, I'll just give you an idea of it. And then in the end, we do the classical bounded model checking, uh, as you probably have heard in the previous talks. And as you probably know, this year, the CAF award went to bounded model checking actually, to the authors who, who came up with this idea. Okay, let's start with assignments and symbolic transitions. Um, so if you look at the at the this algorithm that I have shown you, there are three rounds, right? And a, a, as a system designer or, or a person who writes this code, you clearly think in terms of these three rounds. So in our heads, these are three formulas actually, right? Uh, but you don't see it as a, as a model checker, right? So what we want to have, we want to split this uh, monolithic formula that talks about all possible transitions and rounds and whatever into smaller, uh, into smaller chunks where you have round one here, round two there, and round three here, right? That's uh, our goal is to, to extract the symbolic transitions that are actually in the code, right? Uh, and that happened to be not so easy. So TLC kind of does it, right? So what TLC does, it takes a TLA formula. It, so yeah. It's over here, the transitions. What's that? Round one, round two, round three. Right. It's, it's deterministic, of course. Oh, okay, in this, co in this case, it's deterministic, of course. Okay. But you don't see it at the formal level, right? right? What I want to have, I want to have smaller formulas that, uh, right make assignments deterministic. I mean, okay. there is some non-determinism in, in so data values, right? It's already deterministic, but in general. It's a very nice, it's a very nice example, yes. Right. <laughs> but usually it's more complicated, right? Okay. Right, right, right. So TL, TLC kind of does similar things, but it's an explicit state model checker. It evaluates uh, formulas, right? So what it does, it goes from left to right. And uh, when it sees uh, an equality or, or a set membership uh, for a variable that hasn't been assigned a value yet, it just assigns it's a, it a value, right? Then for disjunctions, it, go, it just goes non-terministically in uh, branches in both directions, right? When you have a, an action level disjunction and also assigns values to the variables and then does some evaluation, right? Um, and of course, TLC has this assumption that if you assign a variable on one branch, uh, then you should assign this uh, variable value on another branch. So it doesn't accept arbitrary TLA formulas. It has some expectations about your TLA code. And our idea is to use these expectations because you're all using TLC, right? Uh, so what we do, we actually have a notion of kind of a branch in, in a TLA formula. It, if you think about Boolean formulas, it's fairly uh, straightforward to, to understand. It's like different evaluations of Boolean variables, right? But uh, in a smarter way, because you don't want really to evaluate all possible vectors of, of Boolean variables. Um, so we want to find this kind of branching, branching uh, uh, blocks in, in the formula. So for instance, here, you want to find these guys as assignments, uh, I assign and you, you will correct me if I'm wrong, right? Uh, you assign uh, y to y prime the value of x prime that is actually assigned here. And to y prime, you assign the value of x prime. But you cannot pick the other guys as assignments because it will cause you know, cyclic assignments. And that's what you don't want to have. So TLC actually wouldn't be able to, to find an assignment here because x prime is not assigned a value here, right? Because it goes just from left to, to right. 
So, yeah. There is a, for brands, there is always a linear overlap. Yes, yes, yes. So we just want, want to find these expressions that actually act as assignments. And then uh, when we found them, if it's possible to find them, then we try to, uh, to find uh, symbolic, symbolic uh, transitions. I will not go any further, it's just if I want to talk, Yura and Tanhai actually know how these things work. Uh, so sometimes we can do better than CLC. For instance, here we can find uh, expressions that can be used as assignments. Right, and CLC would just fail at this point. It will say X prime is not assigned a, a value. But sometimes, of course, uh, TLC can evaluate an expression and stop evaluating the other part of the formula, which we cannot do just because we have a symbolic formula. We cannot understand that this expression never holds true. Right. So currently, we have this. Uh, currently, we have this solution that finds assignments, and then it. Uh, uh, kind of uh, finds uh, maybe minimal, I wouldn't say minimal, good, good enough subformulas that can be treated as, as symbolic transitions. So then types, right? TLA is not typed. What we did again, we looked at what TLC does and came up with a type system that makes sense in our case. It's probably incomplete, but it works, right? What we have here, we have constants like these strings A and hello. Then we have integers, these are just unbounded integers, booleans. Uh, then we have, uh, okay, I'll talk about finite sets uh, in the next slide, but we have functions from finite sets to finite sets. We have tuples, we have records. Records are a bit painful here, right? But in principle, we can express uh, these basic things that you would see in, in, uh, when you run CLC. Right, then we have finite sets. We explicitly say that the type of a variable is a finite set. We have power sets. And the reason is that we want to, to distinguish between power sets because uh, they're quite expensive to, to evaluate, right? You don't want to un unfold them right away. You want to keep this information as, as much as possible. It's actually a power set. And function sets, right? Again, you don't want to construct all, all possible functions unless you really need it. Products and record sets, right? These are not really working now, but in principle, they're in the type system, right? Uh, and then we have this simple type inference. Basically, now we assuming that we know the, the values of the variables at the current state. Uh, we evaluate an expression and try to compute the values of the expressions and the variables in the next state. It's not really, it's not rocket science here. It, it fails sometimes, right? So, for instance, if you if you know that x uh, has type of finite set of ints, then x prime, uh, which is assigned uh, a function like this, uh, will be a function from finite sets of ints to finite sets of ints. And actually, we don't care here, right? We just compute types for the next step. I mean, a normal type inference engine would say you're doing something wrong because you had a finite set of ints and now you have a function. That's not good. But we don't care, right? We just compute the, the types for the next step and encode the next step. Then if you have, if you know the type of Y here, then, uh, and you know by, by this evaluation, Y would be assigned to type in, uh, and so on and so forth. This is an interesting case. If you have an empty set, you actually don't know what type it has, right? It's a finite set of something. And that's where our tool breaks actually in many cases. Because what happens is that if you write something like this, if p then return a set of ints, otherwise return a set of um, an empty set, it will try to, to compute the, you know, the unifying type, but it doesn't work all the time. So sometimes you have to hack it by writing an empty set, like, uh, yeah, like a difference of, of uh, sets that you actually need to have, right? So. That's a hack. Uh, we'll have a proper type and trans engine in the future, we hope. Okay, so and that brings me to the last uh, to the last uh, point in our pipeline that's bounded mal checking. So again, uh, here not so much new happens in, in, in the high level. Um, you know, from the high level viewpoint, what you have here, you just apply this old recipe from year 1999 by Armin Biere, Ed Clark, and others, right? Say so if you have uh, this next uh, next state uh, formula, 
that can invoke two actions A or B. What you do here, first you uh, translate uh, a formula into, into SMT for the init expression, which allows you to assign values to, to the variables uh, for the initial states, right? And again, we use the symbolic transitions. We can kind of compute the values uh, without computing them, right? We know what expressions A will be, and that's the job of the SMT solver to find actual evaluations here, right? Then we take uh, action A and uh, find, uh, introduce some variables uh, for, for co uh, some constants for the variables you have, like X here. So again, it will be encoded in the solver and it's the job of the solver to find proper uh, values for, for these constants. Then we do the same for B. Uh, it's actually, it's a typo here, it should be I1. I think, uh, no, it's I0. So you propagate the values of, of the previous variables. And then what you say, okay, I execute uh, all possible transitions in the sequence, and then I can non-deterministically pick the outcome of, of this step by just uh, selecting one, one of the values for, for the variable. And that happens non-deterministically. Again, it's the job of the SMT solver to, to find whether when, which combinations are possible here, right? And then you just do it in the steps, right? So if you look at the log of our tool, it will try to apply this transition, then this transition uh, kind of should be applied in, in parallel, but we just inter interleave them. And then non-terministically pick, uh, pick the result for all the variables, right? Uh, for, for all the vectors of variables. And we just go deeper and deeper. Then you can encode an invariant in a similar way. And if the solver gives you a SAT, uh, you will find uh, you have found a bug. Otherwise, if it tells you uh, unsat for the, uh, for the invariant violation, then there is no bug. So the big question for us was what was this encoding from, from TLA to G3, right, to SMT solvers. And so we're still working on it. But basically, again, uh, we, we decided just to mimic what, what CLC does in some sense and try to, to do it symbolically. So what we do, we say, okay, you have sets, functions, and whatever you have, we just statically over approximate the structure of these sets, keep it explicitly in our model checker, and then um, throw away the constraints to the SMT solver, and it actually has to find out what uh, what is the actual contents of these sets is and what is the actual constants of the functions is and so on and so forth, right? So we, we have some over approximation of the structure that you create with your code and the solver has to find the dynamic contents. It's kind of like a memory structure uh, in, in an actual execution in a computer, right? So what we have found important is that we have to find uh, some operational semantics for TLA and there is basically none, right? So there is some semantics for TLA, but we have to do it operationally, right? We have to, to find out how to evaluate expressions. And here's our approach. So we have this kind of what we call memory arenas, right? Uh, what we can have there, we, ha we have something like memory cells in your computer, right? We have integers, integer constants of sort int in, in SMT. We have Boolean constants. And then we have uh, all kinds of data structures. For instance, we can have a finite set that statically knows that three other cells can belong to this set. And dynamically, actually, the SMT solver has to find out uh, which of them belong to the set. For that reason, we have a function that tells you what is inside what, right? So we have these cells and uh, the SMT solver has to find out what's, what belongs to what. Right? And since uh, we have uh, GFC here, right, uh, the sets are properly structured, so we don't have cycles. So it makes life easier. Again, if you have functions, uh, what we do, we say here's a function, here's its domain and codomain, and that's very important for knowing the codomain, an over approximation of the codomain, because we have to pick a value from the codomain from time to time. And again, we associate an uninterpreted function in SMT that tells you what actually, uh, what actually you will return if you give one of these guys from the code domain, from the domain, what actually you should return as a, as a result of this function. Then uh, we can have sets of functions. Again, it's like a memory structure, right? Uh, if you have 
uh, a set of functions, again, you have a set uh, which describes the domain, the set that describes codomain, and then if you want to find a function, just write a constraint that uh, this function uh, uh, should map uh, anything from a domain to, to, to its codomain, right? Power sets are very nice here. Just say a power set is something that is defined over another set, and that's it. There is nothing else, just a constraint. Right, and I'll just show you, before we finish, I'll just show you a couple of rules so you kind of get impression of what, uh, what it can be on the SMT side. So if you have a set constructor, first you have to compute the cells, memory cells for all the arguments, as you would expect, right? And then would, we would create another cell, which corresponds to the set we construct, that can statically point to, to, all, the, to all of its arguments, right? So if you write the set of one, two, three, four, five, it will just create five cells uh, that, it, that, that it has evaluated ten. Say statically, I can have these cells. If you write one, 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 it, it even stupidly will create all these cells, and it's up to the solver to resolve the issue that these cells are actually equal to each other, right? And then we just say that all these cells belong at the SMT level; they belong to this newly created set. Unions are also very easy here, or very simple here. So you have two sets uh, that point to these guys. The union is just uh, another cell that points to all of them. And again, it's up to the solver to find out uh, who of them actually belongs to, to this set, right? You just try this uh, constraint saying that uh, a cell belongs to the union if and only if it belongs to one of the arguments, right? Then you can have uh, set, com set comprehensions, right? It's a bit uh, more complicated here. Just take all of the cells, uh, compute uh, the predicates on top of it. Again, it's the job of the SMT solver to find out what, what actually happens inside, right? And just construct another set that, uh, uh, that points again to the same cells, but there are some side conditions in the SMT, right? That tell you how, how uh, uh, the cell belongs to the set if and only if it belongs originally to the set and the predicate holds true on it, right? So that's how you would expect it. And set membership, we can also encode it, that's not hard. And set inclusion uh, is again just a, a long formula here, right? Saying if, uh, if uh, yeah, if, if, if at the SMT level one el the element belongs to the set, then the set inclusion should return true. And set equality is again set inclusion in both directions, right? So what we found interesting here is that uh, usually you would need some notion of inequality, right? If you encode things in SMT. Uh, for integers, constants, booleans, it's all easy. It's uh, predefined in SMT. And for the sets, uh, functions, and all these constructs in CLA, you really need to define what it means for, for two objects to be equal. Uh, we didn't want to introduce quantifiers, as I told you, we want to stay on the quantifier-free level. So what we do, we just do lazy equality. So whenever I want to compare, say, two sets, I go in the over-approximation of their contents and define what it means for, for the elements to be equal and do it recursively, right? So then we kind of cache these constraints. If you again use uh, the equality x equals to y, we'll just uh, recall that we already have a set of constraints for this equality and uh, just say uh, return the outcome of the cached outcome, which is another constant in SMT. So it allows us actually to avoid a lot of redundant constraints, we believe, because we don't want to compare things we actually don't have to compare, right? And we just compare the memory contents that is compared actually in the code. Then we kind of explode, exploit locality because you can imagine there are many, many integers and you have 1,000 of sets using some uh, parts of, of this integer space. You don't want to compare them actually, right? Just compare what you need to compare again. And the caching. Caching plays a big role here because we have to cache uh, the fact that we actually have, um, uh, have produced these constraints. So now we have, I don't know, it's like 100 rules. We say 100, but it's probably more now. Uh, that just tell you if you have this TL expression, you translate it into this memory cell and produce uh, constraints, SMT constraints on the side, right? We use a, a Microsoft D3 as a background SMT solver, just push everything into D3. 
And of course, there are many features that are still not covered. Technically, we know what to do about them, but it's an engineering work, right? So we want to have recursive functions, again, unfolded up to some given length. Sequences are just, uh, again, a technical issue, right? They're not very nice. Um, and there is a kind of a painful moment here in CLA, which is called set cardinalities. So we don't know what to do with them in general. If you imagine how you compute cardinalities, uh, how you write constraints, it's really a huge formula. There might be some good uh, encodings for you know, comparing a set cardinality against an integer, which people usually do. And there is also a technical thing like uh, supporting modules, but that's really just a technical issue. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, so the conclusion here is that in principle, it's possible to, to make a model checker, a symbolic model checker for TLA. That was a kind of a question that we asked ourselves whether it was possible or not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are many features that are still not supported. What we actually found uh, during this, uh, uh, in the course of this project, that TLC as a model checker works very well. You would imagine I just push everything into G3 and it's really much faster. And then we have examples where TLC works actually like 10 times faster, or 100 times faster than the, the symbolic model checker. Uh, so it's a good piece of uh, you know, engineering work, first of all, I believe. And second, uh, there are kinds of TLA benchmarks, you know, TLA code that is very deterministic, there TLC would work well, right? And there is TLA code that is very non-deterministic and the, the symbolic model checker should work well. That's kind of a feeling here, right? Uh, what we also have found is that uh, you look at this TLA cheat sheet by Les Lampert, right? Uh, it has like two pages of, of expressions and you're like, wow, just translate it, right? It's all easy. And then types actually play some role there, right? So then you look at, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a function and then you find yourself in, in 10 different cases depending on the outcome of the function, for instance, right? So it's actually a bit hard to cover all the features that you have in TLA. So we are preparing a technical report on it and we want to re release a stable version. As I said, it's a bit unstable now, it will probably crash on your input. Uh, what we need actually from the TLA community, it would be really cool to have more benchmarks. We are currently collecting benchmarks. Tanhai will probably say something about it a bit later. Um, but it would be really good for us to have the benchmarks, uh, 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 to have this TLA code that you really want to get, uh, uh, not verified, but at least handled by, by the model checker, right? Because we are kind of focusing now on the features we see in, in the classical distributed algorithms and in the code that we can find uh, is Google on the internet, right? But uh, probably you have more specific needs. So it would be really good if, if you could contribute some benchmarks. Okay, that finishes my talk. Thanks a lot.